Hello and welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Laura DeAngelis coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios in Coral Gables. And this hour I am here with Dr. Ellen Schwarzbard, obstetrician and gynecologist with Baptist Health South Florida. Doctor, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us this hour. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we begin this hour with the Zika virus. How serious is it? We actually have a video that gives us a quick look at what you need to know now. A lot of studies have shown that people are not taking Zika seriously, and that's terrible. However, Baptist Health certainly is, and I'm, I applaud you wholeheartedly. Among women who are testing positive for Zika during pregnancy, 10% are having babies with severe neurological problems. That's a very high percentage. As we go into the summer, and we're going to see more mosquito and more mosquito bites, obviously protect yourself. There's no question about it. If you are concerned that you were exposed to Zika, more importantly than an immediate diagnosis is protection, most likely sexual protection, okay? So because we don't want to transmit it sexually. Well, as we know, two years ago, the Zika virus made headlines, and pregnant women all over the country, especially here in South Florida, were frantic about having enough mosquito repellent. Eventually, Zika viruses started to disappear in the United States, but experts now say Zika could spread to other parts of the world, like Southern Europe and certain parts of Southeast Asia. So, Doctor, I, I guess the question right now is, you know, for anyone who is concerned still about Zika, what do we need to know? What is the current environment when it comes to the virus? So actually today, 2018, fortunately, is very different than 2016. 2016 was a scary time for pregnant women and the Zika virus, but we have not had a locally acquired case of Zika virus in Dade County here in Miami since now well over one year. So it is not a big concern for people living here in Miami. For people who do travel, Zika virus is still present in Central and South America, so we do have still some concern. Okay, definitely concern. And just to go back to that time again when it was really something on everyone's mind, uh, what was it like in your practice? I mean, were you just seeing a lot of women coming in worried about it? Uh, what, what were you experiencing at the time? So, Laura, mm -hmm. worry is actually an understatement, okay, yeah. I have to say. Um, frantic. I actually had some pregnant patients that were leaving Miami that were wow. able to do that. Uh, patients would basically stay inside for their duration of their pregnancy that they were concerned. Um, I would go over obviously all the ways that you would really protect yourself from the Zika virus. Um, it's transmitted through a mosquito bite and through sexual transmission. So primarily needing to wear long sleeve clothing, stay away from standing water, and then throughout the entire pregnancy, we would advise protection using a condom. Okay, so again, you just mentioned that some of your patients actually were thinking about getting out of Miami altogether. And speaking of leaving this area, and for people who might not be worried about what's happening here in the United States, but they are traveling sometime in the near future, you mentioned we do have some other places to keep in mind. So we actually have a video on something, some ways to help you if you do have plans to travel. So let's take a look at that. You'd do anything to protect your pregnant partner and unborn child. Did you know that Zika is still a problem in many countries around the world? It could be at your next destination. Guys, you could get Zika and pass it to your partner without knowing, even months after traveling. Protect the ones you love. If you travel to an area with risk of Zika, strictly follow steps to prevent mosquito bites during travel and for three weeks after you return. Use condoms every time you have sex for the rest of your partner's pregnancy, even if you don't have symptoms. Zika can cause serious birth defects. Pregnant women should not travel to areas with risk of Zika. Again, so we just saw doctors some tips again for anyone who might be traveling to places affected that we know are affected by Zika. And I think again, what's important to point out is it's not just the women, men need to take protection too. So talk about that importance, please. Absolutely, so my pregnant patients today still come in and one of the primary questions they are still asking about is Zika. 
So what I do explain to them is how it is not really a problem here today in Miami, but it is important for travel purposes. So I do advise my pregnant patients not to travel to any places that do currently have Zika and the CDC website is a very good place to look for anybody who is considering traveling. Uh, baby moons are very common. <laughs> patients do like to travel, so it's very important. And then people travel for work. The patients travel for work, their spouses travel for work. So it is extremely important. Um, and as we just saw in that video, when the partners are traveling, um, if they do go somewhere and it, they don't have a choice, um, when they do return, using protection and con condoms are extremely important. Um, the primary vector is mosquitoes, but it is transmitted sexually. Okay, and that's important to remember. And doctor, you mentioned the CDC can have information about maybe areas to look out for if you are traveling, but right now, um, just what, are, what do you know about certain regions again, just to kind of be on the lookout for and keep in mind if you are booking a trip right this moment? Right, so the CDC website's great, but it is central in South America are the primary places that still do have Zika. The numbers are significantly lower than what they had been in uh, 2016, but there still are cases there. And Zika is such a potential serious problem for the growing fetus that really the, the precautions do need to be taken. Right, and just to remind people, doctor, one of the, why people are so concerned about this, as you mentioned, because of the growing fetus, microcephaly is the condition that we worry about the baby will be born with. So remind our people, our viewers, what that is and, of course, why nobody wants that to happen. Um, correct. So uh, the Zika virus, if a pregnant woman actually contracts the virus, um, that is the most severe complication that can occur. Fortunately, that is more of a rare complication. It is about 3% of the time, um, but there are many other complications that can occur. Um, so it can affect um, just the brain in general, and then growth is a big problem. Uh, so even in any trimester that the woman is infected with Zika, the, the baby can be impacted. We do see a greater effect if it's earlier in the pregnancy, but really during any trimester, the baby can be impacted. Okay, and for anyone who might be traveling to an area that is known for that, if they return and they are concerned that perhaps they were exposed, what would you tell someone to do in that situation? So there are recommendations about testing. Um, the testing, unfortunately, is not great, um, but we do have testing available. There's a lot of false positives, and my personal experience uh, in 2016, when it was a big scare here, is that there were a lot of false positives. Okay, and as far as, Doctor, again, that's if we come back, what we might want to do. But again, things to take with us uh, if we are going to be going to these areas. Is it really just mosquito repellent? Uh, again, just some tools to take along to make sure that we are safe. Right, so if you can avoid the travel to these places, um, that would be the priority. But if you had to travel for some reason, um, especially if it's, if it's the spouse, they wanna protect themselves from the mosquitoes. The um, Environmental Protection Agency does have the recommended mosquito repellent to use, and it is safe um, for even pregnant women to use that. So we do recommend that. And then when they return, they really should abstain from being sexually active for the remainder of the pregnancy. Okay, and we also have, we have recommendations, the CDC, of course, as you mentioned, there are recommendations for mosquito repellent, as well as other ways to prevent. Um, and we have that here that, again, as you said, cover and repel. So wearing the certain clothing, getting rid of dump, dumping water. Doctor, you referred to this before too, the standing water that may, you know, accumulate around a home, put barriers uh, between yourself and mosquitoes with the screens, the door screens and the windows, use your air conditioning. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, use condoms um, because, again, this is a sexually transmitted disease. And uh, again, luckily, not here to worry about in South Florida necessarily, but really just to keep an eye on if you are going to travel anytime in the future. Uh, absolutely. Today in Miami, uh, we are currently safe for the Zika virus. I do tell people 
um, you know, be careful, use mosquito repellent, but we are not in 2016, fortunately, anymore. Yeah, this is definitely good news. We want folks to know that it's a good news situation. The panic that you experience, as you mentioned, you had panic. I mean, people really wanting to even move out of the area. So I'm glad to hear it's not like that anymore. A little breathing sigh of relief, I think, even for you, doctor. Uh, right? Absolutely. A lot of time was spent in my office discussing Zika. Okay, well, I'm glad we can move on to the next discussion, if you will. And, and that being said, we started off this hour talking about Zika, but when we come back, we're also going to get details about another possible virus that could be affecting people. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss out on that. And you are watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time. Please be sure to stay with us. And anytime you want, be sure to check out our website, allhealthallthetime.com. That's where you can submit your questions for the doctors, find out about health topics from A to Z, and about all the programming here on the Health Channel on South Florida PBS. Stick around, we'll be right back. The Alter-G can be used for everything from athletic population, from young kids, high school, college, professional athletes, all the way to our older populations coming in with hip replacements, knee replacements. When you get into the treadmill, they wear a special spandex pants that has a zipper on it. You zip them in. When we turn on the treadmill, it fills up with air. It goes through a little process where it kind of gauges how much the patient weighs. It starts you at 100%, and then from there, we bring them down at that point. I run track and cross country at St. Brennan and my knee I started getting knee pain in like January so I stopped training and I started coming here. It's been good because I've been able to start running before I can actually get cleared so it takes like the weight off my body so it doesn't hurt as much when I run and it's I can start running and getting used to like the motions and everything again before I can actually go out and train hard. When the patient gets in it, usually they're always a little bit apprehensive, um, but in general, the patients usually like it a lot. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a declining memory or other thinking skills, severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. While symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed.
Each year, an estimated 12,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer. Thanks to improved screening and vaccination, cervical cancer is a highly preventable and treatable cancer. Early detection is key. Women should pay close attention to their cervical health by following these guidelines. Start testing at age 21. Women between ages 21 and 29 should have a pap test done every three years. Women between the ages of 30 and 65 should have a pap test plus an HPV test done every five years. A woman who has been vaccinated against HPV should still follow the screening recommendations for her age group. Your particular health history may dictate a different screening schedule for cervical cancer. Contact your primary care physician to talk about your history and schedule your next screening today. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Laura DeAngelis, and I'm here with Dr. Ellen Schwartzbard, obstetrician and gynecologist with Baptist Health South Florida. And we kicked off this hour, Doctor, talking about the Zika virus, which raised alarm in a lot of pregnant women, especially here in South Florida, because of the risk of having infants born with microcephaly, that condition that can cause abnormally small heads and developmental defects. But now there is a possible new threat on the horizon. Just a few days ago, there were several articles that came out about a possible yellow fever outbreak. Now, yellow fever can kill, and multiple reports say in less than one year, 1,131 cases and 338 deaths have been reported from Brazil due to yellow fever. So again, doctor, uh, not to alarm too many people, but this has been in the news recently. Yes. Um, we're talking about Brazil. So what would you just like to say uh, to women who might be concerned about the possibility of getting yellow fever? Right. Uh, so the reason why yellow fever is now a concern here is the same reason why Zika uh, was a concern. It is transmitted um, by a mosquito bite and the exact same mosquito that transmits Zika. Uh, so the same way that South Florida was a concern, uh, we are a concern for yellow fever also. Okay, and again, uh, what kind of an effect could yellow fever have on a woman if she's pregnant? Uh, why is this po a possible dangerous condition? Right, so it really is a dangerous condition for any person. Um, yellow fever is such a serious illness, uh, so really any person needs to avoid that. Uh, pregnant women, your immune system is suppressed. Mm -hmm. That's just uh, what happens and it makes pregnant women more susceptible to get any illness. Uh, so this is a concern for really anybody living in South Florida. The fact that we have these mosquitoes here and because of our climate and also the tourism, the travel, how people in South America come to South Florida is the reason why they think that this could become a concern here in South Florida. Okay, and again, as far as pregnant women are concerned, um, we, again, we talked about Zika and how it can lead to possible microcephaly in, in the developing fetus. So what is it about yellow fever that could result in a, a disease or problem with a developing fetus? So there really have not been real congenital problems seen associated uh, with yellow fever. You really just are concerned more with the actual uh, problem with the health okay. of, of the mom and, right. and all of the population of people um, living here. So the concern is going to be to get vaccinated. Okay. Uh, that's really the best way to prevent getting yellow fever. Okay, and one last note on that. Again, the stories we're seeing are coming out of Brazil. So uh, someone who might be watching maybe is traveling there. Uh, is it worth talking to their physician about the possibility of getting vaccinated then for yellow fever? Yeah, absolutely. So the vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. So in general, it is recommended that pregnant women do not receive this type of vaccine. Uh, but in this particular case, if there actually is an epidemic of yellow fever, or if a pregnant woman were to have to travel, um, they didn't have an option to travel somewhere where there is yellow fever, this is something that could be discussed in, in a 
risk benefit type analysis, sure. then in that situation, the pregnant woman may actually receive the yellow fever vaccine. Okay, so again, really important just to speak with your physician and find out what the options are for that. So, doctor, let's talk about some of the other viruses that pregnant women should be aware of and also talk about potential risks and what they can do to protect themselves. And let's start with pertussis. First of all, what is it? Uh, why is it dangerous and why should pregnant women be concerned? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, pertussis is what causes whooping cough and we're all vaccinated during our normal childhood vaccines, uh, but that immunity actually goes away as you become an adult. So anybody can actually get whooping cough and there's been outbreaks throughout the country of whooping cough, um, particularly, um, again, your immune system when you're pregnant gets get suppressed. So that, that is an issue, but really what we're talking about with whooping cough is getting vaccinated for the pregnant woman and actually all the family members who are going to be caring for that newborn. We want all of these people to be vaccinated so that way you're protected and if that way you won't be actually at risk for getting that and then passing it on to that newborn baby. Okay, good to know. Now again, we kind of started the hour talking about Zika and uh, while things have calmed down here in South Florida, we are getting into kind of peak mosquito season, if you will. So um, just again, to alleviate any fears, what should people know about it as we get into this peak time? Uh, I know the mosquitoes love me, so this is something I kind of worry about every year. But uh, again, just what people need to know, in particular the women that you take care of in your practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with this potential concern for yellow fever, Zika is not a concern right now, but as we do get into mosquito season, you do want to take general precautions against mosquito bites. Uh, we're not talking about staying inside. We're not talking about leaving, right. leaving Miami with right. the climate and, and having uh, the mosquitoes here, but general, general protection. Mosquito repellent is safe to use. A lot of pregnant women uh, are not aware of that, so it is good to know that it is safe to use mosquito repellent. Okay, good to know. We'll, we'll definitely load up on some of that. I know I will be doing that myself. Now, um, one other thing that we want to talk about with pregnant women is influenza. Um, let's talk again about why they should be concerned, uh, ways to protect themselves against that. Yeah, influenza, uh, again, has a very wide range of how it manifests. Anybody can get influenza. Um, pregnant women, as I've stated, your immune system is suppressed, so mm -hmm. a mild flu can become very, very serious in pregnant women. Um, they could end up in the hospital, they can end up in an intensive care unit, so it is really, really important to do whatever you can to try and decrease the risk of women getting influenza. And we have a vaccine. <laughs> yes, we do. That, that, that really works out great, so it, it is very, very important that pregnant women get vaccinated for influenza. Um, and very similar to pertussis, when you do get vaccinated, um, you are passing immunity on to your baby and your baby's going to actually be born with, with protection before the baby is able to get vaccinated. All right. How, how great is that? That's a win-win basically yeah. right there. Um, now another condition, you know, chicken pox. We hear about it amongst kids. I know I got it, I think I was in second grade. I think I infected half of a gymnastics class or something, but you also hear sometimes pregnant women have an older child at home who is dealing with the chicken pox. So the question is, how can women stay safe during that pregnancy if they have an older child at home who might be fighting the chicken pox? Right. Um, so fortunately, a, a lot of women did get the chicken pox when they were younger. Um, so when that pregnant mom comes in and she's alarmed, my child has chicken pox, what should I do? The first thing you can actually do is test them for immunity. If they're fully aware, they remember, I was four years old, I had a horrible chicken pox outbreak. Right. They, they're, <laughs> they're aware, um, you, you can reassure them. But you could always test them for immunity, and that way um, you can really reassure them that they don't have any concerns for their un unborn baby. Um, today, chicken pox, it's really not that much of a concern because either we had it as a child, we have a vaccine, um, so people today are all getting vaccinated um, when, when they're young, so that, that is great. In addition, fortunately, hopefully, a lot of people are going to come in for that pre-pregnancy visit, right. 
<laughs> not yes. everyone does that, right. but if they do, that's a, a very important topic of discussion. Um, did you have the chicken pox? If they're unsure, they didn't, you can test them and you can vaccinate them before they're pregnant. Okay, you know, and that's a, a great question right there to follow up on that. You just mentioned coming in for a, a consult, if you will, a pre-pregnancy consult. Why don't you talk about why that is important and how during that visit you can address some of these fears, maybe find out more about the mom's history and how that's just going to make for a better pregnancy uh, overall. Oh, absolutely. Um, not everyone does that, <laughs> but, but if they do, it is a great opportunity to discuss being up to date on your vaccination. So uh, varicella, chickenpox is one of the important ones that you can absolutely discuss at that time. Um, and if they're unsure, test them for their immunity. Um, if they end up that they were not immune for varicella, that's a great opportunity to vaccinate them. In addition to going over a tremendous amount of information at that pre-pregnancy visit to, to get them ready for that that pregnancy. Okay, sounds like a great visit to make. So, all right, Dr. Wafter, a great start here. We've talked about ways pregnant women can protect themselves, one of them being vaccines. And speaking of vaccines, when we come back, we're going to talk about them for pregnant women right here on the Health Channel, All Health All the Time. And of course, you can always check out our website, allhealthallthetime.com. You can submit questions for all the doctors and experts here and to find out about all the programming right here on Health Channel on South Florida PBS. Don't go anywhere, we're coming right back. Even with Medicare Part D coverage, about 5 million adults aren't taking their blood pressure medicines as directed. So why does that matter? Because high blood pressure is one of the leading causes of heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, and death in the United States. Along with healthy food choices and regular physical activity, blood pressure medicines reduce those risks, but only if prescriptions are filled in the first place. And one in four adults with Medicare Part D skip doses or stop taking their medicines altogether. Ask questions about how to correctly take your medicine and why you need it. It's easy to download free tip sheets and tools to help you or your loved ones take their blood pressure medicines on time and in the right amount. To learn more, visit millionhearts.hhs.gov. Intoins basically when your child comes in and walks with their feet pointing towards the midline. Most people walk with feet out about 10 degrees, pigeon toes with the foot inside. Intoning is very common. It's by far one of the most common reasons uh, for us to see patients in the office. Uh, but most pediatricians do a very good job at telling you if there's, if there's something more that needs to be done. It can come from three different places. It can come from your thigh bone, your tibia, or your foot. And any one of those things can be curved to cause the foot to progress forward. We now know that this condition improves on its own. Uh, it doesn't cause any lasting issues, no arthritis, no other joint issues or bony issues. And uh, the bracing can actually cause weakness that can maybe even delay the progress of them getting better on their own. More than 90% of these kids will outgrow this, absolutely. <music> Emily is thinking about taking a dietary supplement. She knows she should try to get her vitamins and minerals from the food she eats, but she doesn't always have the chance to eat right. And with more than 50,000 dietary supplements on the market, like a lot of other people, Emily has questions. Like how much vitamin A is good for you and how much is too much? If something's natural, doesn't it mean it's safe? Can folic acid prevent birth defects? Should we be taking calcium and vitamin D supplements? Luckily, there's a place everyone can go for answers. It's the website of the Office of Dietary Supplements. We're part of the National Institutes of Health, and since 1995, we've been conducting, funding, and evaluating research that we use to educate the public, giving Emily plenty of information she can share and discuss with her health care providers. We're ODS for what you need to know about dietary supplements. Hello. I'm Dr. Jose Sosa with Baptist Health Primary Care. Dementia is not a specific disease. It's an overall term that describes a wide range of symptoms associated with a declining memory or other thinking skills, severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. 
While our symptoms of dementia can vary greatly, at least two of the following must be significantly impaired to be considered dementia. Memory, communication and anguish, ability to pay attention, reasoning and judgment, visual perception. If you feel like you or someone in your family might be experiencing these symptoms, contact your primary care physician so that an evaluation can be performed. You are watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Laura DeAngelis coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios in Coral Gables. And I am here with Dr. Ellen Schwartzbard, obstetrician and gynecologist with Baptist Health South Florida. We've been talking this hour about healthy pregnancies and vaccines are the most important first step when it comes to protecting pregnancy. One vaccine pregnant women should think about getting is the whooping cough vaccine. So we're actually gonna take a look and what you need to know about protecting you and your baby from whooping cough. Let's take a look. Thank you. Oh, that feels so oh, good. Feels good. Laura you. Stevens will I'm soon be a first time chase. parent. Um, so she watches her friend and mother of four to see how it's done. Cooper, please don't grab the cup from him anymore, though. Okay? That sounds like gibberish to me. <laughs> Laura also relies on her friend for advice. Supposed to be getting the vaccine for the whooping cough. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, the whooping cough vaccine. I just got mine on my appointment was last Wednesday. So have you done it with all your kids? Health experts recommend pregnant women get a whooping cough vaccine, also called Tdap, during each pregnancy to give babies important protection in the first few months of life before they're old enough to get their own vaccines. Perfect, baby's moving around okay. Why is early protection important? Most babies who get whooping cough during those early months struggle to breathe and get very sick. For some, it can be fatal. So how does my getting the whooping cough vaccine protect my baby? What happens is when you get the vaccine now in the third trimester, your body forms a protection, and in the third trimester, that whooping cough vaccine actually delivers that protection to the baby right from birth. Is it safe then for me and the baby? Absolutely. In research, there's been no evidence of preterm labor, no evidence of low birth weight. In my experience, I haven't seen any issues or problems with it. Unfortunately, whooping cough cases are on the rise. We now see between 10,000 and 50,000 cases each year in the United States, and whooping cough is highly contagious. Because the disease is often mild for adults and older siblings, caregivers may not know they are infected and mistake it for a cold or other minor illness and pass it along to the baby. It's recommended that women get vaccinated during the third trimester of each pregnancy, and this is because the vaccine's protection decreases over time. So let me show you the nursery. We've just really started getting it together. But I just really want her to get here <laughs> and just to be able to hold her and experience all these things that my friends have been able to experience. You, like Laura, have the power to make sure your baby is born with protection against whooping cough. Ask your doctor or midwife about getting the vaccine to help keep your newborn safe from the moment she takes her first breath. Aw, very heartwarming to see those beautiful images there of a happy and healthy baby. So, uh, Dr. Schwartzbard, let's talk again a little bit about what we just saw in the video and uh, just your thoughts on it and, again, why it's so important to get protected against whooping cough. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as they said in the third trimester, because this is when getting that Tdap vaccine, which protects against the whooping cough, will actually give that unborn baby that passive immunity. Um, when the baby's born, it doesn't have a strong immune system. Right. So here you are actually passing um, the, the antibodies that you get from the vaccine, um, passing it on to the baby. So you are giving that immunity onto the baby. Um, and it is recommended in every pregnancy. Patients come in, oh, I got it in my last pregnancy. I need yeah. to get it again. And, and yes, we do recommend giving the vaccine in, in each pregnancy, each baby. You want each baby born with that protection. Sure, as much protection as possible. And you know, just to remind people too, what is whooping cough? I mean, it's, it's not just a minor cough. Let's talk again about the seriousness of this. Right, um, as they also said, in an adult, it can be a very mild illness. You might not even realize you're all that sick, but in, uh, in a newborn baby, they can get very, very sick. It's a infection that affects the lungs and they can end up uh, with a severe illness, end up um, 
requiring real lung support. So sure. um, very, very sick. Yeah, we saw the images of the little babies with the oxygen, tu the tubes in their nose, so mm -hmm. obviously having trouble breathing, and nobody wants to see that happen. So again, you mentioned it's the Tdap vaccine is specifically for uh, whooping cough? Exactly. So the P stands for pertussis. Um, that is what causes whooping cough. Um, the T stands for tetanus. Um, most people do remember getting a tetanus shot in their life. So that's the one that's going to make your arm a little bit sore. So we always <laughs> remind people that is really the side effect of this vaccine. They're always worried about concerns from getting a vaccine. But for this vaccine, it's local discomfort, irritation um, from getting this vaccine. Okay, and doctor, we've been talking, of course, about whooping cough and then other vaccines to receive during your pregnancy. Um, let's talk a little bit about influenza and also um, if you are going to travel, I guess we can talk about that. But let's start with influenza. How can women protect themselves and tell us about the vaccine, uh, whether it's a good idea or how they should discuss that with their physician? Right. Um, so influenza vaccine is important. Um, the same will hold that you will give your baby that passive immunity. So the baby will be born uh, with protection when the baby's born. The baby's immune system isn't as strong, just like that pregnant mom. So yeah. it's very important that you're giving that passive immunity. But here, you're really giving that mom that protection. Um, people, a lot of people have had the flu and it can put you down pretty, oh, yes. pretty horribly. <laughs> uh, but for pregnant women, it's actually more severe. A pregnant woman, that influenza can become a severe pneumonia. It yeah. can really put you in the hospital for an extended period of time. So here, we're really giving it for those multiple reasons. You're actually, it's very important that you're uh, protecting the mom's health and passing it on to the baby. And we can't forget about the family members here. Very we, true. We, we really right. want to be protecting uh, the family members. Uh, by protecting them, you're preventing them from getting these illnesses and passing it on to the baby. Okay, we want everyone in that household happy, healthy, so when the baby comes into the world, the baby will be yeah. healthy as possible also. That makes good sense. And, um, and let's not forget about the grandparents. Oh yes, <laughs> right, and again, you know, maybe that's something to bring up. Let's talk about the grandparents, why it's important for them to even know their own health and uh, mm -hmm. why we don't want them to get any of these diseases either. Yes, yep, so all, all the grandparents, they're gonna be spending time with these newborn babies too. Um, they want to protect themselves and also prevent themselves from passing these illnesses on to the, their new grandchild. Sure, absolutely. And we should point out too that whooping cough really is extremely contagious, right? So if you have it and you are with other people, I mean, it's, it's one of those things kind of like the common cold, the germs are around. This is something, again, very contagious, doctor. Absolutely, yeah. So we need some protection for sure. Okay, and uh, again, we talked about the... Uh, whooping cough and the influenza and again just the importance of looking into if you are traveling um, maybe there's a trip coming up just to kind of keep an eye on I guess the situation there if there's any uh, outbreaks we talked a little while ago about yellow fever coming out in Brazil mm -hmm. so again just another word of caution to people to just keep an eye on what might be going on in the region they're taking whether it's a family trip or a little escape uh, why it's good to stay informed. Yeah, travel is always brought up uh, at these appointments with my pregnant patients. Is it safe for me to go to this place? Um, if you're pregnant and you don't have to go somewhere where Brazil, where they are having yellow fever, um, try to avoid going to, to these places. Pregnancy is a real defined period of time where you, the health of the baby really needs to be of utmost importance. So you wanna look into it if it's something that's absolutely necessary, it can't be avoided, then we have to take everything into consideration. Sure, that makes good sense. Doctor, one thing we should point out, we have been talking a lot about traveling, uh, and let's remind uh, pregnant women out there too, when it comes to flying, what are kind of usually the guidelines about when it is safe to fly, and then maybe when you should consider just taking maybe a little road trip as far as a mini getaway goes, as opposed to getting on a plane? Right, well actually, flying in the planes is really generally very safe. Okay. Um, both the first and the third trimesters is just the most highest risk time period in pregnancy in general. Um, so the second trimester is really the safest time in general for travel, um, just so you can sort of be home with your family, with your physician in the first and third trimesters. As far as getting actually in a plane, especially if it's a very short trip, we really don't see 
dangers of being up there in the sky. Oh, in the that's planes. good. So maybe plan the baby moon in the second trimester. <laughs> so second goes second trimester is a great time. Sounds like a good idea. All right, and Doctor, as we start to bring things together in this segment, if you just wanted to leave our viewers with kind of one important message with uh, speaking with the physician about vaccines or just protecting the baby um, from potential harm, what would that be? Yeah, vaccines are safe, okay? Um, we haven't, a lot of studies have been done. We haven't found any concerns to the baby and you really are protecting both yourself and, and your baby. So please go get vaccinated. Okay, good to know. And again, any fears you may have, physician, obstetrician, and gynecologist, always the best line of defense, if you will, or your best ally to try to make that all come together? Yeah, absolutely. Prevention. No, no question about it. You want to take care of yourself. Okay. And let's not forget about nutrition, right? I mean, we're talking about vaccines and protection, but we want to make sure we're doing healthy things on a daily basis for, for the mom and for her baby. Oh, absolutely. I can't talk enough about nutrition. Okay. So good nutrition. Talk to your your gynecologist, your physician, and make sure you're doing the right things. All right, doctor, we know you're not going anywhere, so that's good news. We have more coming up, and we want you to stay with us, too, because coming up next, we are going to talk about a rare infection that you should be aware of while you are pregnant. So don't go away. We're going to have a lot more coming up. And in the meantime, why don't you check out our website, allhealthallthetime.com. There you can submit your questions for all of the doctors and experts here and find out about all the different kind of programming on the Health Channel right here on South Florida PBS. Stay with us, we will be right back. The purpose of clinical research is to help understand how the human body works and how health and disease come about. So we wanna understand what makes good health. I think women's participation in clinical trials is extremely important because we are have an entirely different set of issues, whether whatever body system you're working with, it's different from a man and from a child. So there are certainly differences there that we need to understand and focus and realize that are specific to women. Science has shown and taught us that men and women are different in, in a variety of ways beyond the obvious differences. Uh, our organs are different, our level of our hormones are different, we respond to treatments and medications differently. Um, based on those findings, every single cell in a woman or a man's body is a male or a female cell. And those cells respond differently to different uh, triggers, to different treatments, and to the environment. A concussion is a type of traumatic brain injury, or TBI, caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or by a hit to the body that causes your head and brain to move rapidly back and forth. This sudden movement can literally cause the brain to bounce around or twist in the skull, stretching and damaging the brain cells and creating chemical changes in the brain. What you might not know is that these chemical changes make the brain more sensitive to any increased stress or injury until it fully recovers. In the past 50 years, We've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Even with Medicare Part D coverage, about 5 million adults aren't taking their blood pressure medicines as directed. So why does that matter? Because high blood pressure is one of the leading causes of heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, and death in the United States. Along with healthy food choices and regular physical activity, blood pressure medicines reduce those risks, but only if prescriptions are filled in the first place. And one in four adults with Medicare Part D skip doses or stop taking their medicines altogether. Ask questions about how to correctly take your medicine and why you need it. It's easy to download free tip sheets and tools to help you or your loved ones take their blood pressure medicines on time and in the right amount. To learn more, visit millionhearts.hhs.gov.
welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Laura DeAngelis, and I am here with Dr. Ellen Schwartzbard, obstetrician and gynecologist with Baptist Health South Florida. And so far this hour, we've talked about Zika, other viruses pregnant women and moms should be aware of, and the importance of getting vaccines. And now we shift our focus to a rare infection called taxoplasmosis. So, Doctor, first of all, can you tell us what is Taxoplasmosis. Sure, toxoplasmosis is caused by a parasite. Um, this parasite you can get from eating either undercooked meat, um, you get it from cat feces that was, that they consumed, the parasite, or you can actually get it from uh, contact with contaminated soil. Um, so it, it, it is rare, but it's something that is out there and actually is still a concern for pregnant patients. Okay, and is it specifically for all pregnant patients or is it those who might have a weaker immune system? I mean, how might that play into whether someone is at really high risk for developing a problem from uh, toxoplasmosis? So toxoplasmosis is a concern for anybody with a decreased immune system. So somebody with HIV, somebody who is undergoing chemotherapy, but the reason why we are concerned for pregnant patients is toxoplasmosis can be harmful for that growing baby. Okay, good to know. Now, kind of an interesting story here regarding taxoplasmosis. There have been several reports in the news recently about the USDA killing thousands of kittens due to taxoplasmosis. Now, according to these reports, Congressman Mike Bishop is calling for an investigation on the USDA's experiments in which hundreds of kittens are reportedly being killed by incineration. Now, the experiments involve breeding the kittens, hundreds of them, feeding them parasite-infected raw meat for two to three weeks, and then they kill the kittens by incineration. Now, according to the USDA, the experiments are being done to combat the parasite and to learn more about it. And uh, doctor, just uh, curious, you know, seeing this coming up in the news recently, just kind of your take on, on what's going on here. Yeah, so I did read about that. My understanding is that they are doing um, research about toxoplasmosis to learn more about it. And what the congressman found out is while doing this research, they're infecting these cats, and rather than treating these cats um, that have the toxoplasmosis, is that they're actually killing the cat. Mm -hmm. So this is what people, animal rights, and rightly so, are kind of up in arms about it. Right, it, it's definitely kind of an extreme, something we haven't seen much of, obviously, in the news. And I'm actually curious, in your practice, um, I'm wondering how common are you seeing any kind of complications from taxoplasmosis? Um, what has your experience been with your patients? Yeah, so it's a question I ask all my pregnant patients at that first visit, do you have any cats? <laughs> so um, it, it is something that comes up. So if they do have cats, I do advise all my pregnant patients that they are not to change the litter box. That's something for the other people in the household. Mm -hmm. um, they're off the hook. Um, if they have to, we say to use gloves, but better to just try and, and stay away and to be as safe as you possibly can. Yeah, that makes good sense. Have somebody else do it. And again, doctor, it's because, as you said, don't touch the litter box. It's the feline feces that are actually the problem, right? It's, and it's coming in contact in skin, or again, what is it about the feline feces that can lead to this problem? Right, so as if you were to actually ingest it, you get it on your hands, your hands to your mouth. So. Um, you wear gloves, you wouldn't want to actually ingest it. So um, this is where you need to be careful. Um, just anything you can be the safest is, is what we recommend. Okay, and you know, doctor, this is such an unusual or kind of a rare, again, infection. Um, I mean, is this something that came about by how? Is it one woman just had this problem and it went from there? I mean, as far as the background goes, how did, how did we even know that this could be an issue? Right, well, I mean, just like any abnormality that has happened to a, a baby or a person is they find out that that's what the cause is. But toxoplasmosis, they also have it in undercooked meat. That's right. a recommendation I make to all my patients. You have to be careful. You don't want to be eating that very rare meat. Also, when you work in the garden, um, in that soil, if that could be contaminated also, you really need to be careful with that hand washing. Um, very, very important. Okay, and again, as far as you just mentioned cooking with the meat, so again, is it keeping it at the right temperature? Um, and 
also, as you mentioned, washing of the hands if you're, uh, excuse me, handling some of this as well, We're correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you just want to make sure that you can do whatever you can, these basic preventative measures uh, to make sure that you don't get something like toxoplasmosis and pass that on to your baby, which um, can be very detrimental. Okay, so therefore, uh, let's go back, doctor, and kind of recap. We've talked about a lot during this hour, kind of wrapping it up with a rare, a rarer infection, I should say, but let's go back to the beginning and start off with, again, the importance of when you first talk to your doctor, uh, whether they do a pre-visit, you said not everybody does that, but when they are first pregnant and speaking with their doctor, um, the important things that you do discuss with the women to make sure that they have their healthiest pregnancy possible and that their child will be born healthy and, and happy. Yeah, no question about it. That pre-pregnancy visit, there are so many different topics that, that you want to discuss. You want to go over uh, their backgrounds, um, you know, where they come from, anything um, genetic that could be going on. You want them to be as healthy as possible, um, their weight, their nutritional status, the, their vitamins that they're taking, uh, that we want to go over, that they're up to date on their vaccinations, which we've touched on a lot today. Uh, you want to make sure that they're supplementing with their folic acid, right. their omega-3. Um, these are really important things to be taking. The folic acid decreases the risk of spina bifida, something very, very easy that they could be supplementing with for prevention. Okay, that is an easy thing to do. And you just mentioned we have talked about vaccines uh, a few times throughout the hour, but again, very important. So again, which vaccines are the most important um, when you speak with these patients to make sure that they've had them uh, and that they've protected themselves? Yeah, the vaccines that you can get before pregnancy and actually not that you can get but you would have to get them before pregnancy are both the varicella and rubella. Um, the importance of these vaccines is that you actually cannot be getting them actually while you are pregnant. So as far as before pregnancy, those are the most important. And then as we discussed during pregnancy is the Tdap and then influenza you can actually get um, during pregnancy, before pregnancy. Okay, and again, the Tdap is for the whooping cough, which we've also said is very, very contagious. So you're just protecting everyone if you make sure that you have received that vaccine during your pregnancy. And each and every pregnancy, right, we should reiterate that for the whooping cough vaccine. Correct, each pregnancy, you're actually passing that immunity onto your unborn baby. So that's why it's recommended to give that Tdap each pregnancy. So every time that baby's being born with that immunity. Okay, good to know. Now, one other thing, doctor, we kind of started off also trying to alleviate people's fears about Zika because the good news, as we keep saying the good news, uh, no more panic, if you will, here in the South Florida area, uh, uh, but people, you know, may be uh, traveling. So just again, a word to people about protecting themselves against Zika. Correct. So sometimes you do travel and you may actually have a Zika exposure. Maybe you did not realize that you went somewhere um, Zika is in Central, South America, usually in the beaches is where you have that mosquito, not as much in the mountains. That's something to think about. Um, if you do have that exposure, women need to either not get pregnant for an eight week time period. And for men, it's actually six months that we really recommend protecting themselves or just not getting pregnant for that time period. Okay, and again, we, we know that Miami-Dade County was previously designated as a Zika cautionary area, um, but again, the panic has kind of calmed down since then. Um, and also just a reminder too about partners um, for these women and you know making sure they're taking steps to protect themselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. The big concern with Zika is the majority of people who don't who have Zika do not have symptoms. Only about one in five people who actually get Zika virus don't have symptoms. This makes it very difficult to actually protect yourself. So for these partners that you're speaking about, six months, I mean, how do they even know if they had it? So that's yeah. why if you do have that exposure, you really need to be protecting yourself for that six month time period to be very, very safe. Okay, good to know. And as far as, again, just kind of bringing it all home, just some other, healthy tips that you do offer to your, your patients when they come in during their pregnancy, whether they be a first time mom or they've had three kids already, uh, just some other daily good habits to kind of keep in mind to keep yourself feeling strong, healthy, uh, and make that a great pregnancy. 
Yeah, so we've already discussed all of this prevention, the vaccines. That's something that we always address each pregnancy. Um, nutrition, obviously, we haven't gone into in detail. Uh, maybe that we'll do that on another episode. You can sure. come back and watch for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, exercise. Yeah. Um, pregnancy is a time uh, that you want to be healthy. You want to make your baby healthy. Um, these are all really important things that, that we're, we touch on at all these visits. Oh. Okay, good to know. And anything that we did not touch on today as far as maybe other viruses or infections that pregnant women in particular need to be on the lookout for? Um, there are some, there's lots of things out there. They're always calling that their older child was exposed to something at mm. school. Um, slap cheek is something that people um, need to be aware of. It's caused by parvovirus and that actually is something very um, harmful for the unborn baby. Um, that's something that you could be tested for to see if okay. you're immune from your personal childhood. That actually is something that happens a lot. Um, so that, that's a big one that actually can come up. Okay, so good to know. So basically, doctor, the, at the end of the day, it sounds like speak with your physician, kind of get the healthy tips, make sure you have had the right vaccinations, find out what vaccinations you will need during pregnancy. We keep coming back to the whooping cough because again, highly contagious. Um, and I guess there's great news just with the mosquito season and coming up here, uh, Zika, luckily in this area, no panic, right? We don't want anyone to panic. Yes. We are very happy that it is not 2016. Um, it is a different time for us in South Florida now. Okay, well, Dr. Schwartzbard, it's been wonderful speaking with you this hour. Thanks for giving us these great tips for a healthy pregnancy and for having healthy babies. We hope to see you soon. Great, thank you very much. Absolutely, and we are so glad you joined us for this hour. That's all the time we have right now. I am Laura DeAngelis, and we thank you again for watching the Health Channel All Health All the Time. Be sure to check out the website, allhealthallthetime.com, to learn lots more. We'll be back after this.